Welcome back to Face the Nation. Artificial intelligence is raising concerns on a number of fronts, even among the companies who have devoted considerable resources towards its development. We spoke with Microsoft President Brad Smith late last week. You said AI offers perhaps even more potential for the good of humanity than any invention that has preceded it. I mean, that's an incredible statement. It's fundamentally an invention that can help us all do research, learn more, communicate more, sift through data better, and its uses are almost ubiquitous in medicine, in drug discovery, in diagnosing diseases, in you know, scrambling the resources of, say, the Red Cross or others in a disaster to find those who are most vulnerable, where buildings have collapsed. Like data crunching, essentially. That's one part of it. Mm -hmm. It identifies patterns in data that may be difficult for humans to access. But in a sense, it's going to impact all of our lives in a multiple of different ways. So think about it as the next step in our ability to learn, communicate, express ourselves. But what should American consumers know about artificial intelligence? It's a co-pilot, if you will, to help us do things. I think one good thing for everyone to know is it's already part of our lives. You know, if you have a Roomba at home, it finds its way around your kitchen, you know, using artificial intelligence to learn what to bump into and okay. how to get around it. Mm -hmm. So it isn't necessarily as mysterious as we sometimes think. And yet at the same time, it is getting more powerful. It can do much more to help us. And I think the other thing that all of us should think about as Americans is, like any powerful technology, we need to keep it under human control. We need to keep, keep it safe. And that will require the work of companies that create it, that use it. It will require, I think, a level of law and regulation as well. You just made a big jump from a Roomba. <laughs> yes, I did. To, you know, the machine takeover here. I mean, when you say that you have to make sure humanity is control in control here, is there really a risk that it won't be? Whenever you have something that fundamentally can do good but could also go and do harm, you put a braking mechanism in place. You put a safety brake, an emergency brake. We should think about AI the same way. What's the most promising concept you've seen? Well, I do love these examples where AI can detect a disease, a form of cancer, before the human eye or other human doctors might. You take something like pancreatic cancer, you know, it is so small when it begins mm -hmm. that typically it's undetectable to the human eyes of doctors. And yet AI is very good at sifting through patterns and detecting things and flagging them. So what's the next um, interface that people should expect? Think of the ability to, in effect, tell a computer what you want it to do. You don't need to learn to code. You can simply say, can you go find information about whether this restaurant is open on Monday nights? And if so, does it take reservations? And how do I make one? You can write that in one sentence and get all of the information back. You no longer have to you know, spend your time clicking on links and finding answers. Take that example and generalize further. You want help. You have writer's block. You've got to write a memo. You need to sift through your email. You want to create a PowerPoint slide. You can tell a computer what you want it to do. As I say, we're, we create what we call a co-pilot. Mm -hmm. You don't have to know how to do everything. You just have to know what you want how done do and how to the, ask for it. The information is accurate. I do think that it's in part based on using your brain. I've often found in the world of technology, if something doesn't sound right, you should double check. Mm -hmm. That will still be true. On the concerning side of the ledger, Goldman Sachs predicted AI's ascendance will disrupt 300 million jobs here in the U.S. and in Europe. How fast is this going to happen? It will be years, not decades, although things will progress over decades as well. There will be some new jobs that will be created. There are jobs that exist today that didn't exist a year ago in this field. And there will be some jobs that are displaced. There always are. Mm -hmm. But I think for most of us, the way we work will change. This will be a new skill set we'll need to, frankly, develop and acquire. You have a very deep concern here about deep fakes. Now, this is content that looks mm -hmm. realistic, but is completely computer generated. 
on Monday, there was a photo Mm -hmm. uh, that actually moved the markets. It was a fake photo. It looked real of an explosion near the Pentagon, um, and it was potentially partially created by AI. Mm -hmm. The market sold off quickly. It yeah. was fact checked, yeah. but that image was put out there from an account that looked legitimate as well. So how do you stop something like this from happening? We'll need a system that we and so many others have been working to develop that protects content, that puts a watermark on it so that if somebody alters it, if somebody removes the watermark, if they do that to try to deceive or defraud someone, first of all, they're doing something that the law makes unlawful. We mm -hmm. may need some new law to do that. But second, we can then use the power of AI to detect when that happens. So that means a news organization like CBS would have video that somehow could be identified besides our little, you know, eye icon, something embedded in there that your computers would see. Yes, to absolutely. say this is real. Yes, th th that is exactly where this should go, and I would guess and hope that CBS will be absolutely at the forefront of this. You embed what we call metadata; it's part of the mm -hmm. file. If it's removed, we're able to detect it. If there's an altered version, we in effect create a hash. Think of it like the fingerprint of something. And then we can look for that fingerprint across the internet. I want to ask you about another topic here that's related, the RNC politics. They put out an attack ad using AI, and I know we have video of it. It was meant to mimic um, a news report from the future, from 2024. It said Joe Biden won the election, and then it shows this dystopia. And in teeny tiny little script, in the upper left-hand corner, it says generated by AI. Is that sufficient? I do think that there is some real virtue in telling the public when they are seeing content that has been generated by AI instead of a human being, especially if it is designed to look like a human being, a human face or voice, mm -hmm. so that people know, no, that's not the real person. We, I think, will need some new standards in that space. Who sets that? This, I think, is one of the issues that we're going to need to discuss together and find a path through. Now, we do need to balance that. We live in a country that I think quite rightly prides itself on free expression. We're on the cusp of a presidential election year. How much of a factor is this going to be, these deep fakes and misleading ads? Well, I think there is an opportunity to take real steps in 2023 so that we have guardrails in place for 2024, so that we are identifying, in my view, especially when we're seeing foreign cyber influence operations from a Russia, a China, or Iran that is pumping out information that they know is false and is designed to deceive, including using artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And that will require the tech sector coming together with government, and it really will require more than one government. This needs to be an international initiative. But we've done that in recent years in other spaces. We can do it again, and I think we should. Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, which made chat GPT, testified recently before Congress and recommended an entirely new federal agency be set up to oversee AI. You like this idea. Yeah. But it's also implying that the federal government is not currently up to the task. We do need more than we have. We need our existing laws to apply, they need to be enforced, but especially when it comes to these most powerful models, when it comes to the protection of the nation's security, um, I do think we would benefit from a new agency, a new licensing system, you know, something that would ensure not only that these models are developed safely, but they're deployed in, say, large data centers where they can be protected from cybersecurity, physical security, and national security threats. How do you convince people that this isn't the big, bad tech giant of Microsoft setting the rules of the road and, and running the little guys off of it? We're not suggesting that any single company or the entire industry together should be the one to set the rules. We should have the United States government elected by the American people setting the rules of the road and we should all be obliged to follow them. Look, we need rules, we need laws, we need responsibility, and we need it quickly. There were a number of tech leaders, including Elon Musk and one of the co-founders of, of Apple, Steve Wozniak, who called publicly for a six-month pause in AI systems that are more powerful than GPT-4 or have governments institute a kind of moratorium until there are safety protocols in place. Is there something to that? Do we need to tap the brakes a bit here? I'm not 
inclined to think that that's the answer. First of all, it'll take 12 months to get the government to debate whether to decide whether to have a pause that will last <laughs> for six months. But I think the more important question is, look, what's going to happen in six months that's different from today? How would we use the six months to put in place the guardrails that would protect safety and the like? Well, let's go do that. Rather than slow down the pace of technology, which I think is extraordinarily difficult, I don't think China is going to jump on that bandwagon. Let's use six months to go faster. Let's adopt an executive order here for the federal government, where the government itself says it's only going to buy AI services in certain categories, say, mm -hmm. from companies that are implementing AI safety protocols and the like. You know, let's start to get some legislation moving. And you think this will happen, some, some regulation or some legislation in the year ahead? I do. The world is moving forward. Let's make sure that the United States at least keeps pace with the rest of the world. You can see our full conversation with Microsoft President Brad Smith on our YouTube channel. We'll be right back. We want to turn now to Chris Krebs. He was the director of the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency in the Trump administration and is now a CBS News cybersecurity expert and analyst. Good morning to you. Morning, Margaret. Um, I want to start on some of the other news from Microsoft within the past days, which is that they, alongside U.S. intelligence, revealed the discovery of malware from a state-sponsored Chinese actor embedded in U.S. critical infrastructure that was meant to shut down communications between the U.S. and Asia in the event of a conflict. That sounds a lot like planning for a potential invasion of Taiwan to a lot of analysts. Um, how significant a breach was this? Well, I think it's uh, significant in the fact that it's an escalation or evolution of Chinese capabilities. I think it's no surprise that China is in the cyber offensive operations game. Uh, Ten years ago, Mandian, a cybersecurity company, released a report called APT1 that talked about their espionage capabilities. That same year, uh, there's evidence that they were in U.S. gas and oil systems and stealing network schematics. So from a pure cyber play perspective, China is quite capable. Uh, even, even this year, uh, Director Ray of the FBI said that the Chinese have 50 hackers to every one FBI agent. So they are quite capable. But to your point, what's different about this report is it shows operational preparation of the battlefield. It shows that they are getting in place that if tensions continue to escalate with Taiwan, they are in a position to cut off lines of communication, logistics, and the ability of the United States to support and defend Taiwan. Yeah, this was in Guam, which is a there's a U.S. military installation there in the Pacific that would be very key in, in the event that you just laid out there. But broadly speaking, how vulnerable is U.S. infrastructure to these kind of attacks? Well, I mean, I, I think just as Brad Smith pointed out in the previous uh, se uh, segment is that we are using technology in virtually every aspect of our lives from you know, day to day to operational capabilities and critical infrastructure. So we are highly dependent upon technologies and we don't always implement them in the proper way. And there are vulnerabilities and there are misconfigurations that we've seen bad guys from criminals to state actors take advantage of. But but I think we have seen an improvement in resilience. And I think uh, the, you, the Ukrainians' performance in the face of a Russian cyber onslaught last year uh, shows that you can be resilient, you can prepare, uh, given the right information and the right time and investments to secure and harden and improve systems. Microsoft's proposing an entirely new branch uh, agency, government agency, be set up to regulate AI. Do you think we're at that point? I, I called for the creation of a digital agency last year in a keynote I gave at the Black Hat Conference in Las Vegas. I think we are well past the time that the U.S. government needs to rethink how it in, engages and creates market interventions on technology, cyber, uh, disinformation, and, and beyond. And AI is probably that kind of forcing function that'll push us there. And there is precedent for reshaping government to meet emerging risks. 1939, the Federal Reorganization Act, uh, the, the government was reorganized. 2001, in the wake of 9-11, uh, mm -hmm. uh, we reorganized. I think we're on the cusp of that. And, and I think the issue is that government is not keeping pace with technological yeah. development and the harms that we're seeing in society. 
Well, the U.S., the Biden administration is looking to restrict the sale of certain technologies, export controls um, to adversaries like China, for example. Um, but the CEO of some of the, some of these companies, they don't they don't like it. Um, NVIDIA, which is an AI chip maker, they've pushed back, saying Chinese will just build their own chips. What do you think of this solution of trying to export control? Well, the, China is a significant market for uh, many American companies, whether it's on Wall Street or technology and chip companies. I think the current policy to restrict the more mature and uh, advanced chips uh, to the Chinese market, I think it's a smart policy decision. I think it uh, maintains European and American geopolitical uh, uh, competitive posture. I think we need to think, though, how does this apply in an AI model perspective? And I think that's in part what Brad was getting at with his policy agenda. And that is going to take quite some time from a legal and regulatory framework to really scope these things out and figure out at what points of the, the economy do we make those interventions. Right. So not a quick timeline to turn that around. Um, what do you think? I mean, it, hearing a tech giant ask to be regulated is uh, unusual, <laughs> to say the least. Um, what are we to make of that? Well, I, you know, if you kind of sit back and look at it, uh, the tech industry is one of the you know, least directly regulated. There are secondary regulations that come in through uh, the New York uh, State Department of Financial Services, for instance, uh, and, and other California laws. But uh, I think when you see this sort of push for regulation, in part, it, it says that they're concerned, they're worried, but they're also looking for, I think, a little bit of protection. And I think if you step back and look at kind of the range of risks that you, you may encounter across AI, there are very mundane risks that do not require additional regulation. And, and Brad talked about that. And that's you know criminals using AI to build the better mousetrap. It's students using AI to cheat. But as you get further up the kind of the risk hierarchy, there is disinformation. There's autonomous weapon systems that will have AI built in. And then you kind of get to that point of, uh, as Elon Musk has talked about, that super intelligence turning into the Terminator, there are areas, particularly, I think, on the models, uh, not necessarily implementations in the apps, but the actual learning large language models that are driving a lot of the, the innovation right now. That's an opportunity to look at licensing. And in part, I think what they're trying to achieve is, is some indemnification that, hey, we, we're playing by the rules. You've put in place guardrails. You've reviewed our, our models. Uh, and if it's abused by someone else outside of uh, our control, then that's not, that's not on us protect themselves as well. Um, Chris Krebs, always good to get your analysis. We'll be back in a moment. This Memorial Day weekend, we'd also like to pay tribute to the hundreds of thousands of college graduates this year who may be better prepared for real life than those before them. This spring on college campuses from coast to coast, reminders of the unprecedented challenges faced by the class of 2023. A once in a century global pandemic took millions of lives and disrupted life for billions more. America ended our longest war and Russia launched the first major ground war in Europe since World War II. Some faced more adversity than others. Graduates at the University of Idaho spent an agonizing six weeks without an arrest in the stabbing deaths of four of their fellow students last November. You've gone through a fiscal crisis, a pandemic, and a horrific tragedy uh, that could shatter any community, but did not here because of the strength and the work and the love that were shown to you. Tulane students had been looking forward to some normalcy in the fall of 2021 after a long year of COVID restrictions. What they didn't expect was an evacuation ahead of what ended up being a Category 4 hurricane. This is a class that came back together after being displaced by Hurricane Ida, only to defy expectations, defeat the odds, and question the status quo. The University of Virginia community lived through the horror of one of its own allegedly murdering three and shooting two others just hours after what would become the school's last football game of the season. The deaths of three students, Devin Chandler, Lavelle Davis Jr. and Deshaun Perry, were devastating. 
The depth of the loss of these talented and beloved teammates, classmates, and friends is incalculable. The tragedy, UVA's President Ryan said, on top of COVID, brought more life lessons than could be taught in any classroom. You rose to those challenges with grace and courage. You masked when it mattered and even when it didn't because you cared about this community above all else. And when tragedy struck last November, you organized and attended a silent vigil that brought this community together in profound and powerful ways. UVA's athletic director, Carla Williams, was invited to deliver the school's commencement address. I had decided to politely decline because I just did not know if I had enough left in the tank to give you guys my best. But as fate would have it, I received a text from Deshaun Perry's mom, Miss Happy Perry, asking me if I thought the university would consider allowing her to stand in Deshaun's place today. I said, it's permissible, but are you sure you can do it? She paused and said, yes, he would be very proud of me and I will power through to do it for him. It was in that moment that I knew I would be speaking today. We thank Carla Williams for her perseverance and for offering this sentiment we wish to pass on to all graduates this year. You are bright and shining examples of the best we have to offer. We need your courageous spirit. We need your innovation. We need your creativity. We need your stubbornness. We need your toughness, your brilliance, your grit, and we need your compassion. We need each of you, and we need all of you. We'll be right back. That's it for us today. Thank you all for watching. Until next week, for Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.